Hi, I'm Trisha Hugelay, Chief of Pediatric and Adolescent Gynecology here at Children's Hospital Colorado, and I wanted to talk to you today about the common occurrence of ovarian cysts and masses that can occur in children and teens. So cystic ovarian masses are, occur frequently in kids and teens. They may be discovered due to symptoms, just on your routine physical exam, or incidentally through imaging studies. And historically, ovarian cysts and masses discovered in kids and teens were removed surgically, often involving removal of the entire ovary. But over the last decade, we've realized that the management should be shifted towards a more conservative approach with ovarian preservation. And the reason for this is likely multifactorial, including advances in radiologic imaging, the identification of tumor markers that allow us to distinguish benign from malignant masses, and the increase in the availability and accessibility of pediatric and adolescent gynecologists within a pediatric healthcare system. Fetal and neonatal cysts are much more common than a lot of providers recognize. In fact, uh, they tend to increase in frequency with gestational age, and with more routine and high-resolution prenatal ultrasounds, we find that fetal ovarian cysts can occur in 30 to 70 percent of fetuses. Most are unilateral and simple in nature, and they will resolve spontaneously. Neonatal cysts are much less common because the vast majority do resolve, but occasionally they will persist after birth and then present and require follow-up by the pediatrician. Um, and generally what we recommend, most of these cysts are benign, again simple and unilateral, and therefore can be monitored every six to eight weeks with routine ultrasound imaging. Now cysts that are larger than five to six centimeters in size have less likelihood of, of spontaneously resolving if they show evidence of complexity suggesting potentially underlying tumor material, and certainly if the infant presented with acute onset pain, nausea, vomiting, suggesting torsion, we would then recommend surgical intervention. Ovarian cysts in children, and prepubertal children specifically, are even less common outside of that neonatal period because the GnRH axis is so well suppressed in kids before puberty. And so when we do see ovarian cysts, they tend to be a result of precocious puberty that's either because of a central process or a peripheral process, sometimes in severe thyroid disease, which can cause multicystic enlargement of the ovary, or in the infrequent underlying ovarian tumor. And in these cases, management really is individualized and involves definitely collaboration with your gynecologist and pediatric surgeons, given the unique nature of these masses. Much more commonly, however, are ovarian cysts in adolescents, and the majority of these are physiologic. The most common physiologic cysts are follicular cysts that occur with ovulation when the mature follicle fails to ovulate. You may also develop corpus luteum cysts after ovulation with a similar um, accumulation of fluid after ovulation and failure of that cyst to involute. Sometimes it can even rupture into its own blood supply, resulting in a hemorrhagic cyst, so they're quite common. These physiologic cysts are often diagnosed as a result of the acute onset of pain. Um, and it's important to realize that a cyst resting in the ovary does not cause pain. That pain arises either as a result of rupture and hemorrhage of the cyst, ischemia and infarction of the cyst, or rapid capsular stretch. And unless one of those mechanisms is occurring, the cyst is generally benign, the patients are asymptomatic, and it very well may be discovered through one of your routine abdominal exams or through routine imaging. When you do suspect a cyst, the imaging modality of choice is a transabdominal ultrasound. And what we are looking for on that ultrasound is the features of the cyst. Is it simple? Is it complex? And unless torsion is suspected or there is a complex mass, the majority of these physiologic cysts can be managed expectantly with serial ultrasounds. Re-imaging after 8 to 12 weeks is generally what we recommend, recognizing that most of these will spontaneously resolve. Now, the decision to proceed with surgery for a cyst that does not resolve really becomes somewhat individualized. Certainly if the patient is symptomatic and having persistent pain, um, if the imaging findings show that the cyst is growing in size, which could increase their risk for torsion, then we would proceed generally with surgery. I often am asked by pediatricians, well, is there a size threshold for where you have to proceed with surgery from the outset? And there actually is not. In fact, the literature really shows that there is no size that dictates the need for surgery. We know that upwards of 
10 centimeter cysts that are simple in nature are nearly 100% benign. And although there is that sweet spot from about five to nine centimeters where the cyst is more likely to torse, it's still an overall low risk of torsion and therefore you don't have to proceed with surgery from the outset just because of any particular size of the cyst. Now we will often see adolescents in follow-up to discuss the possibility of future hormonal cyst suppression. And it's really important to recognize that this should really be an individualized approach with your patients because most cysts will not recur. And the hormonal therapy is gonna do nothing for the existing cyst. It won't cause it to regress. It's really just helping with future cyst suppression. So we try and individualize these therapies and then really talk with the patient and their family about what they wanna do in terms of proceeding with treatment or not. Now, ovarian neoplasms, when there is solid tissue within the ovary, are thankfully much less common than the physiologic cysts, and they account overall for about 1% of all tumors that we see in children and teens. Most ovarian neoplasms are benign, with fewer than 5 to 10% showing evidence of malignancy. In girls and teens, the vast majority of these benign ovarian neoplasms are mature cystic teratomas, what we would commonly refer to as dermoid cysts, or serous or mucinous cyst adenomas. A small subset of these neoplasms, unfortunately, will show suspicions for malignancy. And as I mentioned, about 5 to 10% ultimately will be malignant. Now, the vast majority of these malignant tumors in children and teens are of germ cell origin, which is very different from the adult ovarian tumor that is epithelial cell in, in origin. And this is really important because germ cell tumors are very chemosensitive and have an overall very good prognosis. We again use ultrasound as our imaging modality of choice to look for the cystic and solid features in the mass. We add in Doppler flow to see if there is increased vascularity within the mass. And we develop a scoring system using that along with tumor markers to help determine whether the mass suggests benign versus malignant. And this is really critical because all ovarian neoplasms ultimately are going to require surgery. They're not going to spontaneously resolve. But again, our goal is ovarian sparing surgery. And for any mass, no matter how large it is, if it's likely to be benign, for instance, to mature cystic teratoma, then we would absolutely want to preserve the ovary itself. And so when we have a mass that has a high suspicion for malignancy, then of course we will proceed with an oophorectomy. But using our scoring systems, the most majority of those neoplasms we can preserve. It's also important to recognize that torsion can occur with any cyst, whether it's benign or malignant, um, particularly in, when the long uterovarian pedicle is present. And here it's really, really important to recognize and remember that embryologically the ovary originates at the level of the 10th thoracic vertebra and is actually abdominal in location. And so in that setting, in the pediatric patient, the normal ovary can actually torse because it's on such a long uterovarian pedicle and sitting within the abdomen. And that's quite different from a postmenarchal girl who is through puberty, the ovary migrates down into the pelvis and settles in the pelvis and is much less likely to torse normally. In that postmenarchal girl, it really is almost always in the setting of a cyst or a mass that then the enlarged ovary will torse with on its pedicle. Signs and symptoms of the ovarian torsion include acute onset pain, nausea, vomiting, low-grade fever, and other peritoneal signs on exam. Again, ultrasound evaluation can be very helpful to, help to further evaluate the ovarian mass, to look for the mass, to look for blood flow to the mass, recognizing, though, that it's some of the more significant factors that we know that actually can dictate and predict torsion are when you have significant ovarian size discrepancy between one side and the other. And in particular, when you see evidence that the vascular pedicle has twisted which creates centralized edema and then peripheralization of the follicles. So often we'll see those follicles on the edge with centralized edema. As mentioned, we do add Doppler flow, looking for image of, imaging evidence of flow to the ovary, but it really is important to know that you should approach Doppler flow assessment with extreme caution because up to 30% of adolescents who have proven ovarian torsion at the time of laparoscopy will actually, in fact, show Doppler flow to the ovary on pelvic ultrasound. So it's really important to recognize that ovarian torsion is overall a clinical diagnosis and that physicians should absolutely maintain a high index of suspicion in a young girl or teen who's presenting with acute onset pain, particularly with nausea and vomiting, and especially if you are able to rule out the more common things like an acute appendicitis. 
Ultimately, um, the torsion is managed with surgery um, as soon as possible to help reestablish blood flow and untwist the vascular pedicle. Um, if a cyst is present, absolutely would recommend cystectomy to help prevent that ovary from retorsing. And ultimately, remembering that our goal here is ovarian sparing surgery. And we know with good, both short and long-term follow-up, that the vast majority of ovaries will reperfuse and will reestablish follicular activity, even when the torsion has been more than 24 hours since its onset at the time of surgery. So really important to know that our goal still is to preserve the ovary with follow-up imaging with ultrasound two to three months later to look for that reestablishment of follicular activity. So in summary, it's important to recognize that ovarian cysts are very common, all the way from in utero through young adulthood. And thankfully, the vast majority of these cysts and masses are benign and can be managed conservatively. It's very important to have a high index of suspicion for ovarian torsion and ultimately recognize that it's really a clinical diagnosis with the ultrasound just used to help look for other suspicious factors, but ultimately it's really the clinical patient that you want to be assessing. And here at Children's Colorado, our pediatric gynecology team is here to help you, to help you evaluate the mass, triage the mass, with the ultimate goal of trying as much as possible to preserve the ovary. For more information about our practice and how we can help evaluate and treat you and your patients, um, you can go to our website, www.childrenscolorado, Department of Pediatric Gynecology.